Hello and welcome to Unprofessional Engineering. My name is James. And you got Luke. Luke, continuing our series on companies that built the world, we're looking at DuPont or EI DuPont de Numeros and Company. <laughs> I was like, what is that name? Like, yeah. I saw that and uh, clearly did, un did not understand any of it. Uh, Quick rant before we start, Luke. Oh, no, you have a rant. Oh, I do. If you go to DuPont.com and check out their history tab. It's page, terrible. They start their timeline at 2021. And then you have to scroll all the way to the bottom to get to 1802. And that's what I'm supposed to do is be like, oh, this is great. I want to know how this company started. I have to scroll all the way down to see that. I didn't think it was Come very on. helpful either. Like the stuff they no, listed wasn't. was wasn't very like Wikipedia. Like when Wikipedia does a better history than Ooh, you do tough. of yourself. Like you probably need to, uh, you probably need to fire the the product marketing person that's in right? charge of the website for the history and section. And hire us. And hire uh, us. Yes. Well, that being said, though, Luke, we've done a lot of companies that built the world that are like actually only did one thing. Like we've done some good ones, like BMW, who did really interesting stuff. And then we've done others that are like, now that was our one invention. Dupont has done a ton. This is literally probably the most i'd say it's probably the most impactful of i think all so. of them because of all the different things they made yeah uh, sure. which which we'll get into but um so before we get into the history and all the stuff that i know you love let, let's just uh -huh. talk about like some stats on dupont let's, and let's some hear descriptions. It. um uh, so DuPont uh, operates as a holding company engaged in the development of specialty materials, chemicals, and agricultural products. It operates through the following segments, electronics, uh, industrial, water and protection, mobility and materials. Um, and that's all off the top of my head. Yeah, um, for sure. Uh, the as an investor and large owner. Exactly, exactly. Um, so they basically, if you check out their site, they, they focus on um basically food solar and clean water and then uh like general like chemicals that help the world like there's kind of like three big categories like that they're in i guess that help the world not I those guess. ones that are out to get the world yeah. um they uh they were founded which i know you'll get into because you love your histories back mm -hmm. in 1897 and they are headquartered in Liar. wilmington delaware yeah. Did I, did, yeah. did I get the right date wrong? The well, it's one of those dates that it's like. Oh, it's kind of fluid. Yeah, it's fluid, we'll say. that. Was no pun intended for a chemical company. Uh, that is uh, good, Luke. So they have roughly 28,000 employees <laughs> as of this year was the number that I was able to find. Uh, they have a market cap of 35.3 billion. And as That's I was- a lot of billion. As I was capturing that number, I was like, I have no idea what market cap is. So you're going to get a low education <laughs> here, James. So market cap is what a company is valued at by investors if they were going to sell the company. So like if you're going to sell DuPont today, what would be the going rate for what someone would need to buy that company for? So I that guess is 35.03 about, uh, about well, 35.3. Oh, point three. My bad. So I was uh, shortchanging them. Yeah. So I had. So I was. I felt really smart writing down market cap, and I was like, "That's not their revenue. What is?" I'm that? proud of you for looking it up, though. Luke, I know, as opposed to being like, "Ah, it's, uh, they made thirty five billion. <laughs> uh, their share price is a dismal, uh, as of yesterday, that I could find uh, sixty. Uh, $8.97. Oh, it went up which, since I looked. Uh, which is pretty crappé because That's it looks like, French. yeah, it's French for crap. Um, <laughs> if you, because if you look at the history, uh, they were, they were really good, like back in like the 2000s and they, 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 yeah. they were kind of up and down, but it's pretty low right now. I, yeah. So they do have almost a 2% dividend, which is something, I guess. Um, but I, I was looking at the five year uh, chart. And right now it's at like, what did you say? Almost $69 a yeah. share. It was up to 110 ish, give or take back in 2018. But if you would have gotten in at the first quarter or so of 2020, you would have been in at like 35 or 30. So, oh, like, so it's actually doing well. You could have made some money there, you know, doubled your money, but uh, I didn't do that. 
their revenue last year was uh, $4.27 billion, is what I was able to find. Uh, and their good. current CEO is a cat by the name of Edward D. Breen. And he's been oh, there since Eddie. 2000. So, yeah, so Eddie's relatively new. It's um, interesting that that's all the money they bring in, even though they have 2.5 times the people of Autodesk. And yeah. we're only a little below that, I believe. Yeah, I, I don't know. Huh, interesting. That's cool. So hey, what do you got want, for the history there, want to James? Sponsor an episode. Um, okay, <laughs> histories. Um, founder of the company was a French nobleman. <sighs> Go ahead, Jeez, do it, do it. <laughs> Elethor Irene de Elethor Irene Dupont de Nemours. Nailed is it. The name E L E U T H E R E. With the, little, the e's, with the little carrots. The E's have the little marks, but they're going in different directions. Which, which I had, that is so <laughs> confused. It's very confusing. Anyways, yeah. So DuPont came over to the US of A in 1797 and built a gunpowder factory on 95 acres of the Brandywine River in Wilmington, Delaware. They started out, Luke, with $36,000 with 18 shares of the company being sold for $2,000 each. It then took them two years for the first gunpowder kegs, marked Brandywine Powder, to be ready for sale. I really like the name Brandywine. I, I do think too. that's good. Do you? Uh, bad news. In 1807, so a few years later, good news, I guess. They hit 43000 in sales, but also they had their first explosion as one would expect might happen mm -hmm. in a gunpowder facility. They decided at this point that, you know what? Workers should probably wear shoes without nails in them to avoid <laughs> sparks. What? And also they were forced to turn out their pockets so that make sure they weren't carrying any matches or other I things that might cause that. explosions. Yeah. Um, also, a Connecticut gunpowder mill took the name Brandywine. So the company trademark was changed to DuPont at that time. So that's where we got the name. Uh, moving on, a war tie-in, Luke. There's all, you love the war tie-in. Uh, and they have so many. During the War of 1812, it's great that it's back so far, DuPont sells more than 1 million pounds of powder at an average of 40 cents a pound to the U.S. government. Um, and sales reached almost $150,000, which would be about $2 million in today monies. That's a lot of today monies. That is, that is a lot of today monies. Um, I'm going to zoom through a few of these, but feel free to stop me whenever you Alrighty. want. 1818, <laughs> I guess this is where my mind was at, where I picked this out as important. Five more explosions uh, blew up most of DuPont's operations, but they rebuilt because there's a lot of money in explosions, I guess. Uh, 1834, Irene, I don't know if that's how we say it, but that's how we're going to say it, died on Halloween and left Aww. his sons, Alfred, Henry, and Alexis uh, take over. Maybe so Alexis. Before you move sons. on, you talk about exploding stuff. I do, a lot. Don't ever do this, kids. But back uh -oh. whenever I was in high school, I messed around with black powder a little bit. I could see you doing that. Like, like, like I was into like things that like, if kids were doing it nowadays, they'd be going to jail for and like right, right. being being sent away to juvenile detention Maybe centers. Maybe you should for. have been. Let's and be I do not know how, based off of what I read on this research here about like the explosions and the sparks yeah. and like like it seems really easy for like an explosion to happen when you're working with black powder and gunpowder. Like I don't know how I didn't like hurt myself or like burn down the family house. You do have all of your fingers, right? Wow, that's impressive. Oh, there we go. <laughs> no, I know what you mean. Like kids do dumb Stupid things. Stupid stuff. And you did extra dumb oh, stuff. Oh, extra dumb because I was a dumb kid. Like not only were. was I a kid, but I was a dumb kid. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. bad. Oh, that is rough. Uh, before we move on, Luke, I think it's time we take a break for a word from our sponsor. I know I'm, time flies. When I'm you're guessing it's fun. DuPont, right? We haven't said anything bad about them yet. <sighs> yet. We've actually praised them. <laughs> well, you know, that happens. Shout outs. Uh, shout out number one, Miguel G. I'm a professional electrical engineer. Ooh. And then in parentheses, ha, 
from Puerto Rico who moved to Tampa in 2018 and wanted to strengthen my spoken English by listening to podcasts during my jogging routine. Oh, don't, don't listen to us. Commute. <laughs> don't listen to us. Your perfect title popped up in my search. We all started our careers as non-professional engineers. My first episode was Steve Jobs. Keep up the good research. See, look at that good research. I'm just Miguel. If you're learn, if you're learn, if you're practicing English skills and learning like language skills based off of James and I, uh, everybody's gonna think you're from Pittsburgh. That's a good point, and nobody <laughs> wants that. Um, I I feel like my spoken English is better than my written English. So whatever email I sent back, he's probably like, boy, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> Second shout out is Tim J. I recently discovered your podcast as a product development engineer and hobbyist maker. So, or as one of those, many of the topics have been quite relevant and interesting. I can only imagine what I could do with a Pinewood Derby car with the ease of of it ac and access to a 3D printer. Oh my goodness. Could you imagine an entire F1 car being made out of 3D printed parts? Um, he went on to talk about some of the other things that related to projects that his family did. Sounds like his family did a lot of cool STEM stuff, which is great. Uh, but then also sent pictures of the various Pinewood Derby cars that the family had made over the years. My favorite one, which his mom had made uh, back in the day, was a snail shaped car named S Cargo. And it was like the back of it was a snail shell. So it was cargo, but it was S Cargo. Oh, it was so good. I thought it was very funny. So, so good my, job, mom. My pine cars were one year it was a, a wedge of cheese, the next year it was a wedge of pie. Like it was very, <laughs> I wasn't too creative. So I don't want to talk about my Pinewood Derby experience. If you want to hear about it, go check out our Pinewood Derby episode from a yeah. long time ago. Oh my ago. goodness, that was ages. That's probably four years ago, five years ago. Anyways, um, if any of you want to send me some Pinewood Derby car pictures, if you want to tell us we're doing a great job, if you want to be honest and tell us we're doing a terrible job, anything like that, go ahead and email us at unprofessionalengineering at gmail.com. And don't forget to subscribe, like, we love the reviews. And as always, you can tell your smart devices to play the Unprofessional Engineering Podcast anytime. If you're a true fan, head over to our Unprofessional Engineering store and buy a sweet t-shirt, sticker, or other overpriced items. <laughs> what am I supposed to say? That? They're not overpriced because no, no, no. we make no, money. It's just no. the way it works with these things. Yeah. Moving on to 1851, Luke. 1851. Two things happened to drive up demand. War. First, <laughs> how did you know? The Crimean War. But also, can you guess? Can you guess uh, what else in 15, 1851? No. Oh, the no, no. California yeah. Gold Rush. Beat me to it. I was going to yeah. say Gold Rush. This resulted in an average annual growth of 22%. For like the next five or ten years, something like that. But the reason why the gold rush was dynamite. Whoa! Dynamite. Yeah. Boom. Um, yeah, you're right. So they kind of like uh diversified, I guess. So it wasn't just black powder anymore. We had mm -hmm. dynamite as well that they were doing this. Uh 1861, if you don't have anything before that. Another war tie in. <laughs> Another war. Another war. The Civil War. Um Lamott, L-A-M-M-O-T. This is Alfred's son and chief chemist who got the company's first patent, which is interesting, went over to England on a secret mission for the government to buy enough uh, saltpeter to supply the Union forces with gunpowder. That's a weird word. Saltpeter? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I always thought that was kind of odd too. Uh, 1893 is where I go next. Oh, you and really this... jumped a lot. Okay. Well, eventually you don't want to be like, and then this guy got promoted. And then that guy. Got I'm with that's, you. If I'm you go you. to DuPont, that's what you're going to find on oh, the okay. website. Uh, 93, the company patents a smokeless powder made from a cellulose material soaked in nitric acid. This cellulose would in time become the uh, basis for DuPont's scientists to develop plastics, lacquers, fabrics, uh, film, like movie film, mm -hmm. and other such stuff, which is rather interesting. And then I get into the 1900s. 
So I'm going to take a break and drink my coffee real quick. Do you have anything to add to anything in the 1800s? Uh, I don't think I have anything in the 1800s, uh, but I, I, I do want to make sure. So can we pause and do some of the oh. materials and then come back to history maybe? Because oh, I want to make man, sure that I yeah. get the big materials. So I want all of them, Luke. Uh, so there's a lot. Uh, so DuPont, uh, whether you realize it or not, you are probably wearing something uh, yeah. currently that has something that was invented by DuPont. So I'm just going to go through a quick list. These are in no specific order. Um, but the very first one uh, that I was able to find is Lycra. So uh, this is also maybe a part of my rant. So like uh -oh. spandex, come on. Like whoever thought spandex was a good thing for anybody to wear. Did just... you ever wear spandex? <laughs> so so back in the day, like in basketball, we would have like spandex shorts under our basketball shorts. Yeah. I guess maybe maybe ours were old school shorts, so they no. were a little shorter than they no, should be. No, I but... had so I I actually got in trouble for taking some spandex shorts I wasn't supposed to take from a store, like back in high school. <laughs> <laughs> Do you mean the old five finger discount? Yeah, I took like spandex seven, shorts. I, I it was a thing back then. It was it was when Axel Rose was popular oh, and goodness. just wore spandex as an like with nothing on top of it. He just wore spandex. I, How I, great would it be if Axel Rose snuggled oh, himself into spandex now? I, oh, oh, it'd be terrible. So <laughs> I I went into the dressing room with like nine pairs, and then I came out with with like two on a hanger to put and back. they were just like <laughs> they were stacked like, did you get caught i did get caught kids oh, don't ever goodness. steal it's terrible i was i was Luke, a bad kid so so lycra uh uh so this was invented uh in 1958 by the chemist joseph shriver uh at dupont jojo. laboratories uh jojo good friend of the show mm -hmm. uh the next one this one has kind of fallen out of favor so this is teflon uh, so Teflon uh, is the brand name for a synthetic chemical, chemical called polytetrafluorothene, P-T-T-E. And this is kind of bad stuff. So like pans typically have Teflon on them, yeah, non-stick yeah. pans. And apparently like it, it, it's not good to ingest. So, ma yeah. so making cooking material out of it that you're scraping and then ingesting uh, is probably not uh, a great thing. There's all kinds of like cancer risks and all kinds of stuff with uh, PTTE. So uh, oh. get a really good cast iron pan, season it properly, and you're good. That's that's God, that's what that's I use. Such a pain to clean. Oh, it is. Luke. It's a huge pain. Oh. Uh, the next one is Freon. So Freon. Yeah. Uh, so this is you know what's in cars for you know for air conditioning. Um, so, uh, this, this is also another invention, uh, by, uh, the folks over at DuPont, uh, Lucite. So this is an acrylic plastic or resin primarily used, uh, in windows, uh, and furniture design. So it's basically a transparent, uh, plastic. It's also called like plexiglass, uh, Lucite, um, uh, Ac acrylite, um, mm -hmm. crudelite, uh, pyroclax. There, there's a whole bunch of brand names for this stuff. Um, next one is nylon. So this is uh, a, uh, a, a design that happened uh, by DuPont in the 1930s. Uh, the American chemist Wallace Carruthers, I think. Uh, when he was working for DuPont. Uh, it's a synthetic plastic material composed of polymides of higher molecular weight than usual. Um, and it doesn't have too many, uh, uh, it doesn't have too many fibers. So it's, it, it's like a, it can be like a transparent. Um, mm -hmm. And then the last one that I want to give a shout out to, uh, make sure you listen to our Kevlar uh, and our famous inventor. Um, so Kevlar was developed uh, by Stephanie Kowalik while she was at DuPont oh, in yeah. 1965. She's our Pittsburgh native. She was, where was it? She was in uh, uh, 28. Oh my goodness. I'm drawing a blank on the area where she was from, but she was basically uh, a Pittsburgh scientist that worked for DuPont 
uh, and developed Kevlar, which is, you know, using bulletproof vests, jackets, you know, cars, helmets, tires, tires yeah. you name it. Kevlar has, you know, not only probably saved, you know, hundreds of thousands of lives of, you know, soldiers and police officers and uh, people like that, but it's also make dogs. It, like, dogs, everything. Um, so, so yeah, they've, and that's just a handful of the things they've invented. I don't know if you had any other ones, but. No, well, Kevlar and because we've done Kevlar and I think we also mentioned uh, Stephanie Ko Kowalik. Kowalik in another episode as well. And that's the reason, like, when you were like, what about DuPont? And I was like, I swear we did them already. Mm -hmm. But it was the, the Kevlar episode. So yeah, yeah. check that out. Um, I, I might have one or two that pop up in the rest of my timeline. Okay. But I think before we do that, Luke, we should take a break for this week's Luke's rant. So this rant is all about... Um, and I'm, I'm going to bring it caught stealing spandex. <laughs> no, not caught stealing spandex. Uh, so this is, it, it, it comes back to cookware. So um, I knew we were going to be talking about Teflon. And I don't know when it was, it was, it was maybe a couple of years ago. So I have this, this egg pan that I cook with and it's a nonstick Teflon egg pan. Is it and like I, that copper one, like on TV? No, They're like, no, nothing ever sticks no. to this thing. This is the one that has Teflon on it. And it's, and, and I, I just, I don't understand why they would make products with Teflon in it that involve food. I mentioned that earlier. And the other day, uh, so I'm really good with it. I'm, I only use a wooden or a plastic spoon. This thing is, you know, it, it's it's a great pan for making eggs. Mm -hmm. And then this was maybe, I don't know, maybe not a week ago, maybe like two, three weeks ago. Uh, I come into the kitchen. My daughter's has been learning how to make omelets uh -oh. and she grabbed the wrong pan because this pan only makes eggs. Like this is, this is all that I do with this pan. This it makes, it, it makes over medium eggs. And she is just like scraping this pan. She's making scrambled eggs with a fork. And I can Ooh. see flakes of Teflon like in her eggs. Yeah. And I'm like, what are you doing? And she's like, I'm making scrambled eggs. I was like, that's not, she's, she's like, it's the egg pan. I was like, it's the over medium and sunny side up egg pan. We have different pans in this house for different things. So she totally ruined uh, my pan. And I was like, you can't eat these eggs. That has all kinds of Teflon and chemicals and materials in it that you're not supposed to ingest. So um, so she is forbidden from ever using any of our pans again, at least temporarily until we did can do some additional training. Did you make her sleep outside like a good parent would? I did, I did, job, on, okay. on the deck at least. Okay. It wasn't well, that, that was cold. Okay, well that was considerate, uh, no, that's nice. Yeah, so, so kids, if you decide to start cooking, or even adults, if you're using a nonstick pan, wood and plastic only. I don't know why people don't get that or don't know that. It's just, it, it's confusing to me that people don't know you can't do that. So I had, we had a nice nonstick pan like that and the same sort of thing happened, but I think we immersion blended in it and the immersion <laughs> blender caught the bottom and just like, just the smallest little scratch, right? And, and then it, the small scratch, even once, even if you're using wood uh, yeah. or plastic, then it just starts to spread. And then the flakes start showing up in food and we got rid of it and we've never found one since that's been a good replacement. We use like cast iron or whatever now, but we've still never found a good Teflon. Yeah, replacement. no, there, there's a, so, so Facebook has been throwing all kinds of these hex clad oh, sure. Gordon Ramsay pans yeah, at me. Yeah. And I'm like, how good could they be? They must be really good because they're crazy expensive. Yeah. <laughs> like, You'll get one and it'll change your life. Yeah. Or you won't have a home anymore. You yeah, one or the it. other. Yeah. That was my rant. Oh, thank you. Uh, 1902, can I go back to my timeline? Uh, yes, please. In January, the third generation of DuPonts decided, you know what we don't like is having a company. We want to sell this thing. But Elfie, Elfie DuPont, a fourth generation DuPonter, decided he wanted to buy it up and enlisted his cousins, T. Coleman and Pierre S. DuPont, uh, to buy this up. The cousins buy the business for $12 million in 1902, which would be about $240 million in today dollars. So really, if you think about it, 120 years later, it's now going to sell for 35.3. The rounding error is larger than what they paid for it in 1902. <laughs> That's funny. Um, 1907. Oh, I was going to say 1907 was, they got in a lot of trouble over the years from what I could tell. So I feel like 
like trouble yes but like is it their fault that they're so good like they yeah. acquired well i guess they did acquire 108 <laughs> competitors <laughs> to kind of eliminate the competition and the federal government was like so we have these antitrust laws for a reason so here's a nice lawsuit uh under the sherman antitrust act Funny as it is, five years later, DuPont strikes a deal with the Justice Department, and they spin off uh, Hercules and Atlas Powder companies, um, which ends up not being a big deal. The new companies produce half of the country's black powder and 42% of the country's dynamite. And sales total $35 million, which is about $640 million in today dollars. But yeah, they do, they do hit a couple of other antitrust government kind of issues well, and like chemical as stuff well. yeah because well, they... there's that stuff as well well you know I, and in their defense it seems like it wasn't i'm being very pro dupont today yeah um, you are it, it wasn't really like they were making these things and as far as the research said that they knew how bad it was like a lot of the times it was like oh turns out this is really bad yeah, it was a the high ozone thing. layer yeah okay and they decided they'd stop producing it things like yeah that. but that, i mean they but, probably knew for a while but like when you're taking 55 gallon drum barrels and like dumping them in the river and you say oh i didn't know it was a bad chemical it's like well even if you don't know you shouldn't be dumping stuff in they places. probably just had a giant pipe that went straight out to the river <laughs> uh 1920s so you can tell i got tired of my research 1920s they did a lot of stuff yeah uh, they did they did so much uh the company begins selling film to hollywood for motion pictures mm -hmm. which is weird uh it wins two academy awards for the making and producing of motion films uh duco paint and wood lacquers are introduced and dupont cellophane company begins production in buffalo new york um, and really the reasons I'm calling these out is just to show like how diverse they got. Remember, they started making gunpowder on the river and now yeah. they're making movies and movie film. Like, well, so, really so the twenties and thirties is where they really started getting into yeah. I'll say more chemicals and yeah. you know, obviously the gunpowder stuff kind of disappeared. So like, like you said, so 27, um, they patented cellophane um they also got into some polymer research in conjunction with harvard university uh harvard freon i mentioned i didn't have the date but apparently freon was like in 1930 i think uh Somewhere is what there. i found um which is which is crazy that like that within oh yeah 1930 yep yeah within like three years or two years they they go from like basically you know blowing Almost up their factories yeah, to, <laughs> to like to making film in cellophane and yeah. freon and yeah it's just it, it was a pretty big pivot for them in the 20s and 30s yeah what's cool about freon is it was developed as a joint venture with gm in a company they called like kinetic chemicals mm -hmm. inc uh, and they produced a chlorofluorocarbon refrigerant which was freon so that's kind of neat that they coupled up with gm um oh by 35 so you know how we were talking about all this stuff they were getting into by 1935 dupont's product mix was now 95 percent non-explosives so they were almost completely out of the gig that got them started mm -hmm. um i'm gonna skip that one because we talked about teflon um yeah so the 30s were teflon lucite yeah there was there's a whole bunch of stuff 41, Luke, I have to say 41, because there's more war stuff here. Mm -hmm. uh, DuPont builds 54 plants at 32 locations to help with the war efforts. And guess what so, they get involved in? The Manhattan Project. Uh -huh. Check out our episode on the Manhattan Project. Yeah, DuPont builds a $350 million Hanford Washington Engineering Works to make plutonium for the development of the atomic bomb. DuPont also built an entire city to support the works. It's interesting how many of those cities kind of popped up around the country that it's mm -hmm. like their sole purpose was to support the Manhattan Project. Well, it was interesting too that they started to pivot again. So they got into chemicals and then they actually got into, I, I'll say like, like they, they were almost like a system integrator. Like, like they, yeah. they made the plant that made plutonium. So it's yeah. like, like they all of a sudden got into like mechanical engineering and, you know, structural and like all the things that go to build a plant, which, which I thought was a, what was interesting to go from gunpowder to chemicals to like buildings. It, it seems like an odd mix to me. Yeah. 
Uh, 58, you mentioned Fiber K, which was Lycra, which was Spandex, which was stolen by Luke. Uh, 1969, astronauts on the Apollo 2 mission walk on the moon. What's important about that? Well, they were wearing protective suits, as we know, that had 20 layers of materials, which were produced by DuPont uh, to keep them safe. By 71, so what's this, 50 years ago, the company quits manufacturing black powder and dynamite altogether. So what is that? Not even 200 years, and they've gone from making all of the gunpowder and dynamite to making none of it. Uh, 73, they invented Kevlar. Uh, so again, if you want information on that, check out our Kevlar episode. 88, NASA announces that CFCs or chloro fluorocarbons are the depleting freons. the ozone layer. The freons, yep, the freons were bad. So apparently whenever, whenever you're trying to put freon in your car, you're not supposed to like, you're like, just like open spraying the cans. it around. Yeah. So by the year 2000, DuPont had stopped production of all uh, chloroformin, fluor, chloro fluorocarbons, all the freons. So that's only 12 years to stop the production. I think that's it's pretty, pretty good. good. Yeah. In the grand scheme of things. And that's where I quit my research, Luke. They're involved in all sorts of other stuff, though, that we didn't mention, like food production, agriculture, uh, hybrid seeds, uh, what GMOs. We have an episode mm -hmm. on GMOs. Go check that out. They're involved in hybrid seeds, theaters, newspapers. I guess you have to buy the media outlets when you're, you know, putting holes Exa in the ozone layer. Exactly. But yeah, they owned everything. It's crazy. So, so I have two not so fun facts that are, I say, relatively recent. So uh, I have a handful of fun facts, but let's go with yours so that we can end on a friendlier note. Yeah. After. So the first one is in 2004, the company was fined $16.5 million. So this is not 2004. Small. So they knew what was going on because this, this, this wasn't back in like the 80s or 50s or 30s. Uh, this is by, how we lose sponsors, Luke. Yeah, sorry. Uh, by the EPA uh, for violating the Toxic Substance Control Act by withholding information concerning its release into drinking water in West Virginia. Eh, um, what's West Virginia? And Next they were- gonna tell me it's Jersey. Uh, <laughs> they, <laughs> they, they were releasing uh, something called PFOA, Perifluora octane acid, um, and it causes all kinds of developmental problems uh, in laboratory animals. And apparently, they were just like oh. pump, pumping this stuff into drinking water. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be fine for people. Yeah, it'll know. be all right. Uh, and then the next one. So this is the weirdest one, uh, and this is more not. This is more about like the Dupont family. Uh, so there is this cat by the name of John Dupont. He was a part of the uh, Dupont family, and super bright. Um, and he wanted to be an Olympian. He was really into like sports oh, and athletics. Go ahead. Uh, and he partners up with Villanova to oh, start no. okay. a wrestling program that he wants to like train the Villanova team to be like elite. And it was wrestling. This uh, sounds is what okay. it was. Apparently that only lasted about two years because there was all kinds of bizarre, like inappropriate uh, things happening with him reportedly him and the wrestlers on the team Got a little um, too close in that headlock yeah or something. yeah and, and so it only lasted two years he decides he's going to open up his own wrestling camp for like okay. elite level wrestlers like you. Um, like olympic yeah olympic level like me olympic yeah. level kind of wrestlers um he uh renames the the location on his family farm to fox catcher farms or fox catcher training and it was all about training elite olympic level athletes did they chase foxes uh no they didn't i'm sure it had no. something to do with um uh the fox on the property i imagine uh but here there's a movie called fox catcher uh mark ruffalo the hulk Oh, uh, yeah. plays the wrestler that gets killed because john dupont kills shoots david schultz um in some brand in a duel i know no it was oh there was there no. was some weird stuff going on uh just the movie, cold blooded murder okay. yeah the movie Good. was 2014 apparently uh whenever he actually was caught and tried and convicted it turned out he was completely mentally ill Mm. And you all know, that he, free talk, on. he talked about like seeing ghosts after his mother died and like hearing voices and all these crazy things. So apparently he was just some crazy, nutso rich person. 
Yeah. Uh, I shouldn't say nutso. Uh, no, you he, shouldn't. He was, he was an insane rich person with lots of money who could get away with a lot of things, like thinking you're an Olympic level wrestler. Yeah. Um, but I saw previews of the movie and some trailers. Oh, you haven't seen research. this. I've never seen the movie, but oh. uh, apparently it was a pretty good movie. Uh, yeah. Again, Mark Ruffalo is a decent actor. I mean, he's the yeah, Hulk. Yeah, I like Mark. Fun. I mean, yeah. You know. I mean, if you're the Hulk, you're okay in yeah. my book. So those are my not so fun facts. Uh, so I have a few fun facts. These are all about Alfred. So Alfred seems to be like the guy, even though he wasn't the one who started the company. This He was in charge or a big factor in mm -hmm. when they really started to grow and expand. So my first fun fact is kind of not a fun fact either. This will fall in the loop category. It's kind of mean. Alfred visited an like unusual, we'll say health spa in Michigan, Battle Creek, Michigan. And it was run by, quote, an eccentric health guru of the time, Dr. J.H. Kellogg of Kellogg cereal fame. Yes. No. Yeah. He was so, uh, Alfred was so impressed by this facility that he paid for his overweight niece to be a resident there for a few months to try and help her become less overweight. So that wasn't so nice. Um, next, Alfred DuPont personally answered every letter addressed to him, just like me. Maybe he did it in a more timely fashion. I'm sure he, and he was doing it with pen and paper in like the Pony Express and still got back to people sooner than you do. The first five or so emails I wrote back to you with a handwritten letter. No, you did not. I did, or, and then I started printing them and then, um, and then signing them by hand. And then after like 11 of those, I was like, yeah, I'm just emailing these people. Back. Now you cut and paste and change their name. Hopefully. I don't know. Oh no. I always send a, a thoughtful email back. Um, in his career, Alfred developed more than 200 patents, including the first gasoline powered locomotive, which clearly did not take off. Um, Alfred's parents died within a month of each other. This is weird. This shows like how things were back in the day. Alfred's parents died within a month of each other. When Alfred was 13, he and his four siblings, age, ages nine to 17, resisted the family's attempts to get them placed with like different aunts or uncles, who other, whoever. They persuaded their elders to let them remain at home together, receiving help from the family and the staff that they had in place at the household. Interesting. Here's this 13-year-old just rolling up without any parents. And then last but not least, I almost regret even having this one listed, but um, Alfred, he was friends with boxers John L. Sullivan, uh, and he was all, or it, he, the boxer, yeah, for John L. Sullivan and friends with John Lewis, but he was friends with them in the Boston area when he was attending MIT. University. Why do we have to say MIT in every I know, episode? I, I know. You. That's you why I worst. said I don't even feel good about saying <sighs> it, but I felt like it had to be called out. Anything else you want to add in That's there? all we, I got. This was this was this was an interesting one. I never realized. I mean, you, you hear the name DuPont. I, I feel like they're really yeah. popular like in the 80s and 90s. Like I remember growing up, like DuPont was everywhere. Uh, yeah. but I, I guess they 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 probably are the most impactful. Like I said at the top of the, the show, probably the most impactful company we've done. Yeah, I really enjoyed the research on them. Just the diversity in the like the things they made and invented and how they pivoted throughout the years is really very interesting. Hopefully you all thought the same as we walked through the years or centuries of DuPont. If you have any information about them, if you've ever been to a special wrestling camp, maybe you've been to a Kellogg's health facility, anything like that, why don't you email us at unprofessionalengineering at gmail.com. And until next time, see ya.